nothing that can be said can begin to take away the anguish and the pain of these moments. Grief is the price we pay for love. That was how Queen Elizabeth II famously ended a message read out for her by the British ambassador at a memorial service in New York after the September 11 attacks of 2001. Some have noted that these were strangely personal words from a monarch not known for passionate outbursts of emotion. But perhaps what many people at the time, certainly in America, did not realise was that the Queen herself had lost one of her closest friends on the same day. So when she wrote these words, she really knew how people were feeling. Grief is the price we pay for love. It turns out that she was actually quoting Dr. Colin Murray Parks, who was a psychiatrist at St. Christopher's Hospice in South London. The full quotation goes like this. The pain of grief is just as much part of life as the joy of love. It is perhaps the price we pay for love, the cost of commitment. To ignore this fact or to pretend that it is not so is to put on emotional blinkers which leave us unprepared for the losses that will inevitably occur in our own lives and unprepared to help others cope with losses in theirs. The more I think about this, the more I think he is absolutely correct. For if you are ever going to love someone and enjoy all of the blessings and the joy which that brings, then one day in the future, this is just the way things are. There lies a sharply contrasting time of suffering and loss. Nothing yet lasts forever. This is a hard truth, but it is a truth and it is best if we acknowledge it. Yet for many people, this raises the hardest question with which they will ever have to wrestle. Why does God allow suffering? If God is all-loving and all-powerful, then why do some people get sick and die? Why do some people live in plenty, while others live with wars, famines and bloodshed? Why are there earthquakes, floods, fires, and other natural disasters? Why can't everything just be happy? This is a question that causes thousands of men and women of faith to stumble. It is a key argument for, for atheists and often a question that we might struggle to answer. It is the question that we will consider in this talk. Christians talk a lot about the meaning of suffering. Sometimes people place all the blame on mankind itself. If it were not for mankind, there would be no wars, for example. But that does not explain why volcanoes erupt or why people get struck by lightning. It does not explain why people get sick and why eventually we all die. Many place the blame on Adam and Eve because if they had not sinned, then mankind would not have become mortal. So maybe it's all their fault. But we seriously struggle with a view of God's purpose that makes light the life and death of Jesus Christ just a contingency plan. We don't believe that God decided to have an only begotten son simply because Adam and Eve failed. Sometimes other people say that God lets us suffer in order to bring us closer to him. But this cannot be the full story. Would you ever let your own children suffer terribly? when you could effortlessly save them, only because you wanted to have a closer relationship with them. In any case, none of these ideas explain why God, who knows the very end from the beginning, would give Adam and Eve a test in the garden that he knew they were going to fail. If he had to give them a test, and he already knew beforehand what the outcome was going to be, then why not give them a free will test that he knew they would pass? And even if they had passed, presumably one of their children, at some stage in eternity, was going to fail eventually. What is more, 
Our billions of human deaths and untold, unimaginable suffering really a fair consequence of one man in some garden eating a piece of fruit one day? Does that punishment really meet the crime? I suppose all of these are reasons why this is a question. But what if the answer were not so hard after all? In fact, is it possible that God has left the key to all this right in front of us all along? Maybe, just as the Queen hinted, the power lies in the contrast. Grief really is a price we pay for love, and for a very good reason. What this study proposes is really very simple, and the point is this. Most of the big things in life we understand through their opposites. Let us explain. When you were a child and you were learning about up and down, did you learn about them one at a time, maybe up one week and down the next? Or did you learn about them together, both at the same time, the one in opposition to the other? We're going to suggest that it was the latter, because what does up even mean if you don't know what down is? This is what we mean when we say that we often learn through opposites. Or imagine that you live in a make-believe world where every single sound is at 60 decibels. Do you think that you are going to understand what loud and soft are? Or if the temperature were always 40 degrees day and night forever, would you really understand the difference between hot and cold? The answer, of course, is no. Of course you wouldn't, because we can only understand these and many other basic concepts through their opposites. The interesting part comes when we take this idea a little further and apply it to the character of God. For the Bible is clear that the overall purpose of God with the creation, his master plan behind everything, is to fill the earth with a family of sons and daughters who have developed his character like children who copy a father. If we understand that most of the big things in life are learned through opposites, then how are we going to learn about God's character and so fulfil his purpose? To answer this question, we do well to consider Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, which famously lists for us some of God's attributes. The passage says, The Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. The first of God's characteristics here is mercy. Now, applying the same reasoning as before, could it be ever possible to learn about mercy and to understand what that means in a world where nobody ever needs it, in a world where everything always goes well? And the answer is, no, it wouldn't be. How could anyone possibly learn about mercy if nobody ever saw it, if nobody ever gave it, or nobody ever needed it? That would be like trying to understand hot and cold in a world that was always at 40 degrees. It would not have any meaning at all. Or what about the second of God's attributes in this passage? Grace. Here again we have the same dilemma. How could anyone ever learn about grace if nobody in the history of humanity had ever needed it? What exactly would it mean to be kind to someone if every last person whom you had ever met had always been completely satisfied anyway? Where is the good in a cup of cold water if nobody has ever been thirsty? And of course, it's the same answer, that the concept of grace is also left utterly without meaning unless sometimes people actually need it. 
We could repeat these ideas for every one of the other attributes of God in Exodus 34 that define who he is. Slow to anger, loving, faithful, forgiving, and just. How can you be slow to anger without a cause for anger? How can you learn about forgiving iniquity and sin if there is no iniquity and sin? Or if there were not the possibility that we might not forgive somebody? None of these qualities mean anything at all without their opposites. Just as we suggested, the power is in the contrast. For good to have any meaning, any meaning at all as good, then there must also be evil, at least for a while. We've made a strong case that in order to learn about God's character, we must also experience bad times as well as good. Because what does mercy mean if nobody ever needs it? If we want to appreciate the shiny side of life's coin, then we need to see the rough side too, because it's only the contrast that gives either any meaning. That just seems to be the way things are. This all has the ring of truth. But we can do much, much better than just a little thought experiment. In fact, this contrast between good and evil, suffering and joy, has always been at the heart of God's message and has always been inevitable. In fact, it's the very first theme of the entire Bible. Genesis chapter 1 and from verses 1 to 5 it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. So we see that the very first thing God does is to separate light from darkness. It is a contrast. And because the light is called good, and the light is separated from the darkness, then it seems that by verse 4 of Genesis chapter 1, there is already an implied contrast between good and evil. Just as darkness is by opposition what gives meaning to light, so evil gives meaning to good. Of course, in hindsight, we know that this contrast is going to be the grand overarching theme of the entire Bible. This separation between light and dark, good and evil. The one has always defined the other right from the very beginning. This idea of separation and contrast continues to develop as a key motif throughout the early chapters in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 7, the sky is separated from the sea. And in Genesis chapter 1 verse 9, the land is separated from the sea. But the climax of this idea takes shape in the form of a very special tree mentioned in Genesis chapter 2 and from verses 15 to 17. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So in the garden of Eden there was just one tree from which Adam and Eve were not permitted to eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the implication was that as soon as you ate of its fruit, you would understand both good and evil, clearly intended here as a contrast. However, with regard to this contrast, there is a simple observation that we can make, which seems to be supremely important, so obvious that if we're not careful, we might not see it at all, that there was just one tree, of the knowledge of both good and evil. You might have thought that God would have created two trees, one for the knowledge of evil, which would have been forbidden, 
and the other for the knowledge of good, which God would have encouraged Adam to eat from. But he did not. There was just one tree, which taught about both good and evil. Why would God want to limit mankind's access to the knowledge of good, as well as of evil, by putting this one tree out of bounds? Didn't God want Adam to know about good? After all, by this stage, we've already spent the first chapter of Genesis reading about how good creation was. So why forbid Adam and Eve to know about good? The answer lies in the fact that there was just one tree, for there is no such thing as knowledge of good without knowledge of evil. They must go together. Do you see how this is the same lesson? Just as we can comprehend light only through darkness, or hot through cold, or loud through soft, so we can only truly understand good by contrast with evil, in exactly the same way as these other concepts that we've considered before. There is no other way that God can teach us this. The joys in your own life are your joys, only because your trials have been your trials. Following this thought to its conclusion, Perhaps, paradoxically, God prohibited Adam and Eve's eating of the fruit in the garden because they could never properly understand good unless they had sinned, so that they could indeed learn about good. Otherwise, what did Adam or Eve know about mercy or forgiveness before the fall? What did they know about grace or justice? Remember that as early as Genesis chapter 1 verse 4, there was already a contrast between light and dark, good and evil. It was always inevitable that man would face darkness to learn about good. Such a suggestion may seem challenging to us, given what the rest of the Bible says about sin. But if God gave mankind a test that they were apparently certain to fail, what is the alternative? In any case, the sufferings and sacrifice of Jesus were never just an alternative plan. His life and his death were always at the centre of God's purpose and at the core of his creation. If we wanted even more proof that to learn about good, we must also learn about evil, then this comes in the very next section in Genesis chapter 2 immediately after the law of the tree. Ask yourself what God is trying to achieve in this incident. Genesis chapter 2 verses 18 to 20 says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. Of course, what follows in the next few verses, in Genesis 2 verses 21 to 25, is the creation of Eve, who was a good companion for Adam. But again, it's the same lesson. Before Adam could understand his companionship with Eve, he first had to confront what must have been an alarming lack of companionship when one by one the animals passed by. If you want to have knowledge of good, then you must have knowledge of evil. So Adam appreciated Eve only through the contrast, only because of the opposite. The suffering in the world around us is horrible. Sometimes we see the suffering on the news in a faraway country, sometimes in our families, sometimes in our friends, and sometimes in our own lives. Yet as painful as this can be, the presence of evil in this world is absolutely necessary for the development of God's character in his children. That, above all else, is the reason why God allows suffering. 
It is clear from Genesis chapters 1 and 2 that the knowledge of good and the knowledge of evil must come together. Only through the existence of suffering can God one day fill the earth with his character, his glory and his goodness. The Bible teaches that this was just as true for our Lord Jesus Christ as it was for us. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8 tells us that Jesus was not born obedient, but rather learned obedience through what he suffered. John chapter 15 verse 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. So the greatest act of love required the greatest act of sacrifice. Or again in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, For the moment all discipline seems painful, but later it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So Jesus also looked forward to joy. And lastly, remember that this present time of sin and suffering will not last forever. It is going to pass away forever in the kingdom when sorrow and sighing shall flee away, as Isaiah 35 and verse 10 says. Again, in Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 and 4, God himself will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. A favourite image, especially vivid, in the book of Psalms, Psalm 126 verse 5 says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. So far in this discussion, we've erred on the side of theory and haven't tried to address how we might actually help someone who is suffering. But we would like to finish with a few practical lessons that arise from everything we've considered so far. First, we cannot pretend to understand exactly why every terrible or good event happens in our lives, and we are not suggesting that we try. Maybe in ten years' time we shall look back and see how certain events have shaped our characters, or maybe we won't. Either way, it's important to understand that God does have a plan, even if we don't and that he knows what he is doing, both in our lives and in the world at large. So sometimes life will be hard. Sometimes it will be easy. But it is in the hands of God, who knows what is best for us, and cares for us very much. Secondly, it is important to understand, paradoxically, that it is the bad times that make the good times good. And if not in this life, then certainly in the next. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Grief truly is the price we pay for love. But only in this life, and our final ending, will be one of happiness. Yet perhaps the most important lesson to take from all this is that there is nothing automatic about suffering that will necessarily develop godliness in us. God is the potter, and we are the clay. And whether or not we allow God, through his grace, to mould us into something beautiful is a choice that we alone can make. It is up to us to let God use the pain in or around our lives, for something better. So if we are sorry to see someone suffering, then good, let us go and help them. If we're sorry to see someone ignorant of the gospel, then good, let us go and teach them. And if we are sorry to be suffering ourselves, then at least, even if in hindsight years later, let us try to grow from the experience. It is true that suffering may never be easy to live with, or to witness, we all understand this, but it is how we can develop our Father's character and follow our Lord Jesus, who has trodden this path before us. This has always been God's plan, right from the beginning, and it is 
a very comforting thought. Mm -hmm.